there are people on the online left that will try to get you to commit suicide because you said what? noodles are tasty. And I, I promise you, I'm not oversimplifying it. I'm not twisting it out of like from a biased perspective. That is what happened. Yeah, I don't like Italian food either, but this is just, <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's too fatty. All right, guys, here we go. I'm nervous. This is a content creator I've known about and watched for like a really long time. This is crazy. This is one of those like canon events I keep hearing about. All right, I'm calling. Hey, what's up? Hey, now? Well, uh, I, had, I, I was about to go for a smoke. I thought I still had 10 minutes. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Uh, we we no, can postpone for a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go smoke then. Um, but I'm still gonna like talk to you. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. I'm a fellow nicotine addict. Okay, if I go like yeah. more than five to ten minutes without my vape, it's like constantly in the back of my mind, itching. You know, like oh, yeah. oh, I could use a hit. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those things. Back on vaping. Yeah, it's definitely better than smoking. But I'm trying to like. Once I move at the end of the year, I'm trying to get off of vaping. I just can't take a week or two off to deal with the worst of withdrawal from nicotine at the moment. I, I managed to quit smoking entirely three years ago, and then oh. no, four years ago now. And then after two years, I dated a smoker, and immediately started off again. Like I, I didn't realize that once you quit, you, you have to avoid it as much as you can. You can't date the smoker anymore. Yeah, that'll do it. I got into vaping because I dated a girl who vaped, and it was just like, yeah, I was driving in the car with her, and there was just a, the vape sitting there in the in the console, and I was just like, eh, I'll try it. And I found myself hitting it more and more and more until I found myself buying my own, and, and there you yeah, I there mean, you go. Get back to it because the, smoking is it's it's such a disgusting habit. You smell like an ashtray. You smell absolutely disgusting. The yellow stains that you get on your fingers, on your teeth, like it, yeah. it's just, it's growth and the coughing and everything else. Fuck smoking. I think we should ban smoking. Like everyone should just vape. If there was any, like any mainstream drug like that, that I'd be in favor of outright banning and actually criminalizing, cigarettes would be that. I do think vaping would be, I mean, you literally get. I think you get it's more, more of a nicotine it's buzz. More, it's more how it's marketed, I think. I think like yeah. if weed were legal, more people would smoke weed. It's it's just that I started smoking when I was, I think, 15, 16, because I wanted to be one of the cool kids. Yeah. You know, that that that's like how you get hooked on this stupid shit. And it's such a it should have a far worse reputation than what it has. Yeah, I feel yeah. like I, I don't think it's smoking right now that's that's really the big worry for a lot of young people. Now it's getting into vaping. Most young people are straight up skipping cigarettes overall, and they're just getting into uh, vaping. Yeah. And I know Juul was the most popular because they're the most consistent. That was marketed for kids. That was marketed yeah. for kids. That was, like, really sinister. And he that had was named, evil. like, vape to get off cigarettes. And we didn't have this thing here where, like... I know that, like, when when... When vaping became a thing, everyone on the internet was like, oh, it's gay. It's weird. It's, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. We didn't have that reputation here. Yeah. It, at first it was like that, but then I think a lot of people <laughs> had that one friend that vaped, and then they tried it because it's not as bad as cigarettes, quote unquote. And, uh, you know, that just leads them to becoming a vapor themselves but it is better than smoking it really really is the fact that secondhand smoke and the smell and like the like ju got just the practicality of it i was um i had to take a ferry to an island off the coast of uh 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 off the coast of like seattle recently and it was just the worst because you get onto the ferry it's a two-hour ride and you can't smoke or vape and there's no smoking or vaping oh, areas fly, on this ferry. If it's, you're on a plane, yeah. It's, it's uh, similar on a plane, right? But on a ferry, they don't, like, put you through TSA or check you in the same way that they, at least in America, they 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 borderline cavity search you going through security to fly. So, yeah. um, you know, you can't sneak a vape onto the plane in such a way that you would be able to hit it realistically. People have, but I would never do that. But what you could do 
Not saying I did it, but what you could theoretically do in my position is uh, simply wear a slightly, you know, puffier coat. Not unusual on a ferry. It's kind of cold on a boat. And just kind of, you know, just a little bit of a... I I um I bought myself some chewing gums, some nicotine gums, which I thought yeah. I was going to try soon. But I always like, it's the mornings. The 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 thing about breaking a habit like smoking, yeah, it's breaking the habit is more difficult than breaking the addiction, because yeah. I when I, I I I'm really grumpy when I wake up, and I have this entire routine in my like planned unconsciously into me where. I crawl out of bed, I crawl under the shower, I get wet, then I crawl into my kitchen, I get myself some coffee and I light up. And that is so ingrained into what I do that I can't like, it's, it's so difficult to break. I'd have to break my entire morning routine. The weed I makes the morning headaches go away. I, I thought about like, <clears throat> the first time I quit smoking, I, 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 I went for the really radical solution, which is um, I rented out basically a shed in the countryside. And I stuffed myself in that shed for like a month where I would have to walk two hours to buy a pack of cigarettes. Like it was in the middle of the mountains in nowhere. So that, that's how I broke. And I probably have to do something like that again. I probably have to rent out a shed in the mountains. Like self-quarantine. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah. like the kind of thing you should uh, vlog. I feel like if you vlogged your like self-quarantine in the mountains getting off of no, it's uh, crazy. cigarettes, it would it's be good crazy. content. I, I re like the first week is really bad. Like the first day is the worst. Like you're chewing your fingers because they smell like tobacco. <laughs> no. You know, if you if you smoke a lot, you chew and you nibble on your fingers just for like that sense of like you chew on on straws, you chew on fucking pens, you get really crazy. And once you're over that, there's like a week in which you're really grumpy. Then after like the first week or two weeks that you go through a phase where suddenly everything just tastes amazing. Because one thing that smoking does, it, it ruins your fucking taste buds. And mm. you don't realize it when you're doing it. And once you're off the cigarettes, suddenly, like after two weeks or something, a pizza is just the single most amazing fucking thing there is. Anything food related, anything that the way it tasted before just seemed bland. So there's a risk that a lot of people who quit smoking end up getting, getting a lot of weight out of nowhere. I had that problem too. But then comes the benefits because suddenly you you are far less fatigued. You get this like energetic boost. Suddenly you get like you feel like running more. You feel like walking more. You feel like doing more. Yeah, smoking is really the... yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can quit again soon. You've done it before, so I I have full confidence you'll be able to do it again. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure I will eventually. It's just getting to it really. It's one of those things, you know, you know what the yeah. mindset of just pushing something up until it's almost too late. <laughs> and sometimes it's like legitimately it's not a good time to quit. You know, like if you have a lot of really busy stuff on your schedule, it probably isn't the best time to try to go through quitting. Like, it, like if anything, as much as it would kind of suck, you want to do it when you're on vacation and you've got some time off because you're going to be going through... I mean, I'm I'm not looking forward to it. I I'm gonna be going through some rough times when I quit vaping. Um, and yeah, let's be honest about it as well. Through. It's also better. It's also better than like popping pills, shooting up on heroin, <laughs> or like being a yeah. drug kid. Uh, I dated an alcoholic before. I I know that. Yeah, smoking is like. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's still pretty it's still low bad, on the tier. Still... It, it it's yeah. more so unpleasant to be around then like all the like other drugs tend to be more dangerous to be around in, in the worst case scenarios cigarettes not it's just unpleasant it, it smells bad and it's like ah uh, you don't smoke in the car addicts hanging yeah. around street corners or stealing car radios to get cigarettes yeah yet who knows maybe one day we'll get that <laughs> yeah i mean they are getting expensive right cigarettes oh yeah we tax them in order to get people off i think it's now six euros a pack so around seven eight dollars i think they're more expensive where you are so to be in fair, some countries they're more yeah they're pretty expensive in america um 
It, it is funny, though. I grew up in Florida, and I can confirm I've met one or two people that have My definitely... <laughs> Thank you. I pre I, I'm no longer in Florida. I'm on the opposite side of the country now from Florida and Seattle. Um, but uh, I, I have certainly met more than one person in my life growing up in Florida who has stolen copper wire from an abandoned house in order to buy cigarettes. What do they do? That's funny. It's, yeah. Do you know why Romania has the fastest internet in the world? Uh, is it the low population? No, it's because people kept stealing the wires. They, like, dug up the copper and other wires. So they, ha so they had to do yeah. fiber optic? Yeah. So the entire country got fiber optic cables so nobody steals those. So that's the solution. Yeah. I've got some friends that I need to inform about this. They're going to be thrilled. They love fast internet and copper wire. Um, yeah. Anyway. You just steal the wires, yeah. That's it's <laughs> okay. also why, like, the train, building the trains into some parts of Eastern Europe has been a lot more difficult because people kept stealing the copper wires that are needed to build, like, the electric wiring for trains. That so, is crazy. Yeah. I know that, like, the, the closest thing that I know to that with, like, trains out here is railroad spikes. People steal rail the little spikes that they use to stamp in the rail itself to the wood tracks that then go into the dirt. They take the railroad spikes, and, you know, some people just keep them as, like, a, a thing to have from insert rail line. But some people mm -hmm. forge them into knives, and, you know, they just get stolen a lot, and it's probably not good. Might cause it's, one it's or two not it's, it's not just that like i should be more honest it's not just that like oh they tried to build railroads and the romanians kept stealing everything that's that's a bit too much it's it's also that like uh bulgaria and remain i'm not sure if romania as well but i'm pretty sure that bulgaria they privatized all their uh public uh public transportation networks in the 90s and uh that was a bit of a disaster <laughs> yeah like, fuck there's this this map you can go to. It's a. I've, I'm gonna give me a moment to find out. Rail map distance. There's there's this map you can go to. Um, in it's basically a yeah, got it. Flowing data map, European rail. Um. Why is it not working? Oh, here it is. <laughs> um. Okay. Where. You basically pick a point in Europe. Um, where's your Discord? And and it shows you if you take a train from your city, how far you can get within, I think, twenty four hours. So if if you you see the map on your right, I think I don't know if you can see it already. Oh yeah, I have so it you, up now. Yeah, yeah, and you can see like the best place to live is Paris, because the French rail. I've, French Rail is famous for how efficient and great it is. So if you start take a train from Paris, you can get to pretty much all of Britain, most of Germany within like a very short line, time, within like eight hours, you can be everywhere. The reason you um, can't get to Spain that fast is because um, Franco was paranoid. He believed the French were going to invade him. So he picked a different rail gauge for all of Spain. So it's really difficult to get to. They're still kind of reforming the Spain. But if you browse through this map, and you go east, you notice that, okay, rail infrastructure is improving. But as soon as you get into Romania and Bulgaria, you're in the railroad stone age. It's, it's like within eight hours, you can't get out of Bulgaria because the rail network is so broken and completely messed up. And it's exactly because they privatized it. Yeah. You can just see it. Like, here, here's yep. Romania with like... I mean, it, it it's a little veiny, right? But then you've got, you, you've got like... The whole rest of Europe just veined up, vascular as fuck, but Romania yeah. is just not doing too well. Yeah. We'll they eventually do... improve this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so actually, this actually is a perfect um, segue into um, sort of like the, the perfect place to start the convo. So um, for those of you guys in chat who don't know who Crowd is, do you actually want to introduce yourself to everybody? Uh... I guess in your community, I'm called a shit lib. But what I am. <laughs> My chat probably That's... thinks I'm a shit lib, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we, we kind of. Um, we, we, we had drama, I think, three years ago, me and Vaush. And I yeah. mean, it's been three years, and I think it, it would have been weird if we had all sort of clung on to this. I know that there are some people 
not many, but there's like a handful full of my, of people in my community who really want me to go attack you guys, but I'm not really into that. Or think, oh, come to me, because they think that I don't like you guys. But it's like it's been three years, and you mentioned on a stream that you wanted to sort of, yeah, I think it. You mentioned that you were open to like burying the hatchet completely and just putting a lid on all the simmering tensions. And I think that's a great idea. I think we should do that. Like we don't have to be friends or anything like this or collaborate or work together. Or, but I think it, it would be a good idea to put a nail into the coughing of to just agree that we don't hack at each other or just make it public that we're not really enemies or something like that. No, absolutely. I'm down to be friends. Like I've enjoyed your content for a very long time. Um, like, even back during my cringe right-wing phase, I was, like, into your content. And then when you got, got out of that stuff and started making more general, like, uh, actual political content, you know, like, like real-world, like, like politics, your historical videos, the, the extremely well-researched uh, videos that you do now. You also did the Country Ball content, which was awesome. Um, and, uh, like, that Country Ball content was so influential that in out very much outside of political communities in your community, that influenced memes in other spheres I inhabited. Like, um, like it was. The thing very about cool. it is, it belongs to nobody. Everyone can do country ball content. Yeah, it's a meme. Everyone can do it, which is really cool. I feel like you were the largest figure, like popularizing it though. Like once you started doing it, they were everywhere. I couldn't, I couldn't avoid political balls or there's country a creator, balls. There's a creator. There's a creator who did it before me. Oh. who I really liked. His name was Brain for Breakfast. But he passed away. And a, a year after he died, I sort of picked up this because nobody else was making content like that anymore. He was for a while the only one making content like that. God, hearing he about... He was really great. Hearing but he's a bit YouTubers. of a geographic determinist. <laughs> Ooh. Well, one That's thing one I was... weird thing that you said in that stream because I didn't watch the clip until recently. And then I got to watch it. And it was weird that you consider me part of BreadTube. That that is not so. That is something that I have to disagree with. You know that um, I I checked my analytics about this, like to like really back it up. Like only ten to fifteen percent of my audience watch bread tubers or watch people like Ben Shapiro or Sargon. Like I have, I granted that is still sixty thousand people, but the overwhelming majority of my community the overwhelming people who watch me they like they don't even know who what bread tube is who vouch is who contrapoints is they don't know who ben shapiro is they don't know they don't know any of this stuff right like i have over the last three four years just i've built something completely new like something completely separate from from that sphere that i came out of i'm i, I managed to escape more or less walk away <laughs> you're lucky yeah. honestly like i my personal opinion is that bread tube was this concept come up with by fans of a group mm. of youtubers that just kind of made who like there was a lot of imagined friendships i think from the perspective of the audiences the term bread tube was kind of i think it originated on reddit and there was a bread tube subreddit that was all about sharing um, you know, these new up and coming lefty content creators, whether they be liberals or like moderates, but they generally criticize the batshit stuff coming from the right. Or even if they're just making historical videos that aren't in any way politically leaning, just the fact that they're historical videos means that they're generally useful to a progressive audience for some level of context to some things. Um, that that would get you like roped into the bread tube crowd from the perspective of the audience. So it was this like fan, this sort of parasocial fan enforced idea that I'll admit some creators, including myself to a degree, played into. But after like six months into 2019, it really felt like that concept just stopped meaning anything, particularly because it just became very obvious that no none of the big figures that so much of the audience thought were like these good, you know, tight knit buddies who were working together to create this vanguard of left wing political content, a really liked each other that much or, or B intended to do much in the way of collaboration. I, I, I have so to tell you like, because yeah. I'm not keeping up with anything, like not much with what is going on in BreadTube anymore. I have my reasons for that. We can, we could go into that later if you want. But the thing is that, um, 
I talked to your editor, to uh, Cherry, about this. Like, I knew that there was some drama in that bread tube sphere. Uh, but I honestly did not know that it was this bad. Like, <laughs> I, had, I, did not, I did not know that you've all reached a point where you're at each other's throats. And I, I, I was kind of worried this week if I wanted to go ahead and do this stream with you for a while because I'm not going to get roped into anything here, right? I'm not going to get... I don't think so. I mean, I'm not, okay. I don't, yeah. I don't plan to get you like, if there are any <laughs> topics that like, if there are any topics that you're just like, eh, you can just say, I plead the fifth and we can move yeah, on. Um, <laughs> like we can, it, it, it's funny because like the, the, it's, it's weird where you said that, like the, the reason why you were open to this was the shoe and head thing, because I, I remember the drama that was with, between me and Vash was that I was really like. I was really angry that Shu rebranded as a leftist, and I was really angry that Vash and ContraPoints and a lot of others helped out with that. But you said in that segment that you felt that I was right in retrospect. But yeah. the thing about that is, I actually feel that I was wrong looking back. Like, I really? do legit think that, yeah, because this was just a personal grudge like i know that like i remember from the times that i was active in like that i was like one of these i don't know what to call this sphere when when i was part of that sphere right we, we like to pretend that our interpersonal drama is somehow part of some grand political cause but that's just not the case most of it is just interpersonal and the bottom line is that i just really don't like shoes <laughs> it's completely personal i don't like her that's it um so that's that yeah i haven't been involved in any drama in almost four years that's actually something that i'm really proud of i want to continue that as long as i can that's yeah. healthy no that's completely healthy i i think you have every right to dislike shoe um i personally dislike her quite a lot as well and um I mean, I, I can give a very brief summary of what happened. You were right that, like, I was holding out, uh, and, and I think Vosh as well, were holding out a little bit too much charitability for her. There was a lot of evidence uh, that was, you know, right there about a lot of her past behavior that she had either tried to swipe under the, ru or swipe under the rug or kind of pretend as though was this, uh, pretend as if she'd actually taken some form of accountability for it, but she hadn't. But those were things at the time that, you know, I was willing to look past if her current behavior was more in line with what I'd expect with, like, a decent human being. But she then again and again and again continued to promote conspiracy theories and far-right figures and just basically fell back into her, her old ways. I, I, I should and, tell you, I should yeah. tell you, I did not know that she and Yusufi had a falling out. <laughs> I, I I'm not, so I am so glad that she, it, listen, you are you are absolutely in heaven in in terms of being like a content creator who that. talks about politics because we are in the depths of hell. <laughs> you, you like it's not. I wouldn't not say a, that I'm in heaven. I wouldn't say that I'm in heaven. I just yeah. I, I, I it can be very confusing. We had um. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah. it's it's just a lot of pointless drama at the end of the day. Like, if I could go without having to cover or, like any drama that happens in this space or having to respond to people who call me out, I definitely would. Like, I more prefer like when I have to cover a video about me, no matter how well I know I can respond to it, it makes me nervous. I don't like hearing somebody, no matter how few people agree with them, just lying and saying things they know are wrong about me for the appraisal of some that, group that, of that's people. just generally something with how the internet works like it's amazing yeah. how much you can it's amazing how much you can just make up about people and get away with it and yeah, yeah. That, that played a massive role in like how i got like cancelled by my old community by the anti-sgw sphere back in the day back in late 2017 and i think like um there's a guy who i really love in that regard like if you were to ask me who had like the most important impact on like the youtube culture and how people engage i think it's the right opinion like um i know I like he's a drama youtuber but yeah i think people give him far less credit than he deserves i believe he deserves a lot of credit because before him if you look at youtube drama most of the stuff that people were accused of is just shit that was made up 
People just made things up about people. People just lied about people tried to artificially instigate drama. And the reason why I love the right opinion so much is he did this thing of just fact-checking drama. That's what his videos are. It's just being honest about things. It's just fact-checking what actually happened. And he changed the entire environment around this. I do genuinely believe that ever since he appeared and started making his videos that you can't just go out there and just maliciously make things up about people anymore, or at least not to an extent as much. Yeah, a lot of the drama content was just being a lot of content creators who just wanted to push out a nonstop stream of content and their main sources of it were forums that were all about like gossip and making things up about content creators. And so you had a lot of big drama YouTubers and big dramas that were like career enders back in the day, like mainstream YouTubers and stuff like in the Minecraft community, etc., who would just get accused of really bad shit. But then it turned out didn't even happen. Just the entire thing, even just like online, weird online events and movements. Like, um, if you if you watch the video that started Gamergate, if you watch Mr. Make a Wish's cons conspiracy video, yep, and you just take the time to 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 fact check all of it, you you realize that almost everything he says in it is insinuations and made up. Yep, every and, bit and of that it. That was very frequent. Yeah, I. And, I... Oh, sorry, I'll let you go. No, no, no. I, I, I was just going to end by saying that the right opinion is the guy who ended this kind of culture. He's the guy who sort of put his foot down and said, okay, no, let's fact check all these things if they're really true. And I think he doesn't get the credit he deserves. He deserves far more credit than he gets. Yeah, I, I really like uh, the right opinion. We were moots on Twitter before my Twitter got yeeted by, uh, by Elon for the X branding. He, he had to get it from me. Um, <laughs> the um, Yeah, no, I... One of the things that I really appreciated about that sort of evolution in drama content was that, um, and The Right Opinion is one of a few content creators that actually puts that amount of work in, is a genuine dedication to not peddling a narrative that's good enough to get views and to get by online without getting called out, but genuinely taking the time to look into it and, like, even though it's not going to get any extra praise, still put in the work to put out as truthful of a reporting of the events as possible. And that was something I really respect about his content because he made videos that straight up debunked the popular yeah. narrative that had been set for years about some people. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, he, doesn't get the, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Yeah, Eventually awesome. he will. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eventually he will. And and another thing as well, and I think you'll appreciate this too if you want to go back and watch some of these for nostalgia. I um I've so I've taken a habit of doing lore streams where I go back to famous oh. videos from back in like the Gamergate era and go over how they have been misrepresented and telephoned through the internet into something completely different. Like the um there's a pop that they're not. <laughs> God. Yeah. I like haven't done any of that in like ages. Like Ah, uh, like the the last drama I was involved in was with Sargon, oh. um, three years ago or something. Like, yeah. oh, like that that it, it still kind of makes me angry thinking about it. Like, um, how do I put this? How do I begin? So, I sometimes get conversations with people who were cancelled, right? Who who sort of like ask me what i learned about this because for me you know it's almost like when was that that so it was in like late 2017 early 2018 so it's almost six years now that that happened and the one like the one thing that i can tell everyone is once you rebuilt your channel once you've you know gotten back up onto your feet once you've rebuilt everything that people destroyed right the people who cancelled you will be the first to slip into your DMs. They will be the first to be nice to you, the first to be like to crawl into everything you do, try to get your attention, try to. And I had a complete freaking, like, I had a raging meltdown when that happened because it just so fucking infuriated me. But yeah, that, that was like, yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry. I just, where were we? Exactly? It's relatable, though. It's relatable. Yeah. I had the same thing happen to me with a lot of shit, too. 
I've had one like, or I, few, I, one or two. I, I was very happy about that drama because, like, when 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 I got out of that sphere, I was like, I really didn't walk out of it. I was kicked out of it. But it's sort of like the 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 thing that I wanted to do initially for like the first two three years was sort of I wanted to rebuild a liberal YouTube community more or less, because I think like the the, the term liberal at that point was a meme. It was a mockery, and it was really Sargon's fault. He was the one who destroyed it with everything that he had done over years, where he basically, his entire content was basically that was a guy who pretended to read books and to, oh, this is liberalism. You know, liberalism is when you side with the Nazis in online debates and blah, 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 all that shit. And yeah, he destroyed the term. He destroyed the very idea of it. And the reason why I, I'm kind of happy that I had this drama with him, because I think as a result of it, he fucking finally stopped calling himself a liberal. And now I really don't talk about him much at all, because now that he fucking finally calls himself a conservative, I don't need to care about anything he does anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of it's just yeah. breaking the, the lie that they try so desperately to hold up about themselves to be appealing to a more moderate audience. Once you've done that, you've just kind of... I don't think he does that anymore. I don't think he does that anymore. Like, from what I've well, yeah. heard, like, I don't, I don't really know what he's up to, but one of the last things I've heard is that he's now... Because Brexit failed so miserably, he's now advocating for the reintroduction of the death penalty because that will apparently solve all the issues brexit caused you know that's <laughs> yeah yeah uh, sargon is one of those people that um well i haven't thought of or heard his name in months you were you you were the first person to bring him up to me in a in quite a while that is how at this point yeah, like, no, no, we, we, we were like talking about drama like this was the last drama i was involved in was him yeah um, when my channel hit, I think, 300,000 or 200,000 subscribers, when I had videos out that were get, getting, like, millions of views, he slipped in my, my DMs and like, hey, I, we're still friends. Nothing ever happened. And what's really gross is that some of the old writers who, like, harassed me for years also slipped into my DMs. I was like, oh, hey, let's, let's let bygones be bygones. Do you want to promote my leader of the white race podcast or something like that? It's just... Ugh. Uh, no, completely shameless people. Yeah, really they're all. Uh, uh, yeah, they're all in it for clout. Yeah, I, I I think that is generally something that will happen to everyone. To ever at any point got canceling is a really weird term. I like to be very careful with how I use it. Like I like to differentiate their things. I think like I I fundamentally believe you can only be canceled by your own community, mm. by your own audience. And if someone riles up an outside audience against you, that's not a cancelling, that's just harassment, you know? Yes. So in, in, in a way, it was a blessing in a disguise for me because my subscriber count dropped from like 138,000 to, I think, analytically to 60,000. And basically what it did is just it removed all these people from my channel. They're gone. I didn't need to appeal to them or worry about them. I just had to go and build something new after that. And... Yeah, the, the the one lesson that I could draw out of all of it is like there's something that stays with you that only people who've gone through the same thing kind of relate to, which is you do you you become hyper self critical, you you become worried about how your content comes across. Like I go through these phases where I have a real I'm actually going through one right now where I have a really hard time finishing a video because it's just you know it it becomes a slog to a degree. But the one thing that I can tell everyone who's ever gone through something like that is if once you've rebuilt, the people who cancelled you will be the first to slip into your DMs. They will pretend that you've always been friends. They will pretend that nothing ever happened. And don't do what I did, which is have an angry meltdown. <laughs> which, yeah. That I was, mean, wow. sometimes, sometimes the internet just kind of pushes you to the point where it's like, fuck it. And, and and you have a meltdown. Listen, everybody's yeah. had a meltdown. It's not so, like anybody who claims they haven't is just trying to sound cool on the internet. Um, but like, uh, my, I, my I think thing with Shu, I, I think I should yeah. explain to you why I hate her so much. Was like the um, I don't want to really name his name because I don't think he's worth being named. You know, you know what? It, there's this um, there's this um, confusion in Confucian rhetoric in China, right? There is this phrase that you can um, you can kill someone with the silence of contempt. You know that 
if you really hate someone, the best way to murder them is to just completely ice them out and be quiet and never mention them and never acknowledge them. I think I would like to do that with this particular person. I'm gonna murder them with the silence of contempt, I guess. But yeah, yeah. that that guy, Nazi podcaster, he harassed me for almost two years. He doxed me, he doxed my entire family. He did things like um he called my he called my mum at two in the morning impersonating police officers and a police officer and told her that, oh, your son has committed suicide. You need to come take the four hour trip to us to pick up your son's corpse. Shit like that. And he did that for like two years to me. And he got banned from YouTube eventually. And back in those days, like that was like 2019 and leading into 2020, he had a regular audience of like up to 2,000, 3,000 viewers per stream. And he got banned off YouTube, and that was a blessing to me, right? Because fuck him. Like, it, him getting banned off YouTube meant that I didn't have to deal with his shit anymore, right? And then Shoe and Head rolled in, went on this fucking tangent about how unfair it was that he got banned, promoted his new platform, and the shit just continued. And she did that just six months before she suddenly rebranded and claimed to be the most leftist leftist that ever leftist around, <laughs> which was like, yeah. No wonder you were mad, man. Like, I see, that's, yeah. that is why after, because what she did towards me was also really fucked up. And I, I, I won't bore you with like the lore explanation if you don't want it. But like, when, when I dealt went through that, I, I thought about it because you'd, you'd came up a few times. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't think Kraut likes me very much, but come to think of it, I mean, it's been a while, and also, I had that falling out with Shu, and he was totally right. Uh, I didn't about know that, that happened. Bad. Yeah. I didn't know that. Like, I had a completely different thing, because as much as I like to mention that kind of stuff, you know, I, I wasn't exactly the nicest person to people as well. Like, yeah. I mean, in the videos that I made in the past, like, I called Riley J. Dennis a man. I harassed Cat Black. Like, these are things that I have to do. Uh, sorry, that I did in the past, and I have to, what I wanted to say is, I have to also draw my own conclusions and reflections out of this. Yeah. You know, and it, so and it... I don't... Oh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, and, and it's always one of those complicated situations of, like, because I, I know for a fact that you genuinely, like, don't stand by, like, the the bad oh, stuff no. that you believed and said back in the day. Um. And I, I feel as though, from your perspective as well, Shuan Head was almost cheapening the idea of somebody genuinely learning from the mistakes it, 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 of what from, they once for, believed in changing. For, like, my little group, it was, like, a, a, a very different experience because, you know, we were basically, you know, I, th there was this, like, I, I talked to, other, to a few other people in BreadTube about this as well. There was, like... There was this internal split in the anti-SUW sphere, which never really came big to the surface. There were people like me, Jeff Holliday, and David Sherratt and co, who didn't like that we were bringing in all these alt-writers to stream with us. And it always followed the same pattern, right? The these so-called alt-right debates that we did, right? Where, where Sargon did a stream with some alt-right YouTuber or something like that. They, they always began the stream by saying, oh, we disagree about so many things. Yeah, we do. So now yeah, let's ramble about SJWs together. Like, it was very, really, yeah. And there were people like, like Jeff and me. I haven't talked to Jeff in years who were, like, really aggravated by that and didn't like it. And then there was an opposing side who wanted to bring them in more, right? And that sort of boiled to the surface in, in late 2017. And like my little group of people were sort of disillusioned Sargon fans. And we spent like, like this is, this is one of the mistakes I made, I guess. Like we spent way up into 2020 basically talking about what went wrong. We looked at everything that had happened. We looked at the videos we made. We discussed what this community was. We actually streamed some of it. We called it skeptic aut autopsies. <laughs> Um, but it took us to a, a while to realize, like, we, we tried to figure out, okay, what was the jumping off point? What was the point where this all went awry? We never, it, did, it took us a while to realize that actually this entire format that we did was 
bit from the start and was never really worth saving because that entire community was just built on a, a notion of go out there and attack, 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 attack. Right? Yeah. That's all that it really was in the end. And it, there was no point at which any of this could have ever been saved. It was never worth saving at all. It was worth burning down. Like the thing with, with me, what I did back in 2017, I just basically wanted to turn anti-SGW YouTube into anti-alt-right YouTube. Now, you can think of that what you want, if it was positive or not. But the thing about it is, in the end, it would have still continued that culture of attack, 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 attack. We weren't really ever arguing any points. We weren't really ever arguing a case for anything. We were just a group of bullies. That's really all that there was to us. So, yeah, it took me a while to realize that, yeah, we, like I, I understood starting in 2017, actually early 2008. Like I was canceled at Christmas, which is really weird. But anyway, um, <laughs> like halfway I, I, I into the next then, year. Yeah, I, I realized then that we definitely made mistakes. But it took me two more years to realize that it isn't just mistake, not just that we did mistake, but that the entire thing was a mistake, that it was never worth saving, basically. Yeah. Yeah, the the crazy thing for me was, um, I almost mentioned this earlier, but uh, something I started doing recently are the, like these lore streams where I would deep dive on things that have sort of been um, morphed by the internet game of telephone into just something unrecognizable from the reality behind it. And a good example of that is the classic uh, bl short blonde hair, glasses, red shirt, like angry SJW. You've all seen the image. And um, we she did, wasn't like, a, angry. She wasn't angry. Was a, we, yeah, I, like I know that. We we do like breakdowns of those videos and and those images will become immortalized in uh in meme culture as like this ammo used against the left used to attack the left and and straw man um and it's not just the the right that does this obviously but when you look at examples like that and you see entire cultural movements built on misrepresentations like that you start to wonder how much more stuff was like that. And you keep Almost digging and find it. out pretty much all of it. Yeah, like down to the like yeah. the conspiracy thing to the like uh, anti Anita Sarkeesian thing. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, wasn't the amount of money that she got donated that seemed so huge an extra amount of donations voluntarily given past her set goal? And so she delayed the series to improve the production quality. Like, I, I, I think don't that know was about the story. That. Like the, the the main thing I did was look at a, a Make a Wish video, and and just realized that almost everything he said about Zoe Quinn was just made up. So yeah, yeah. but I didn't I didn't look deep into the end. I never really made that many. I don't think I ever made a video about Anita Sarkeesian, which is like the one thing that is sort of exceptional to me. <laughs> yeah, she was like the big um, one to cover yeah. back when it first all like blew up. From 2014 to 2016, Anita Sarkeesian was prime content. People, actually... people in private were like constantly sort of like as much as these people publicly always talked about how much they hated her in private, they were really giddy and looking forward to her videos. They were in a very weird way that her most loyal viewers and subscribers because that was their content farm because they didn't have anything else to offer or even to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, 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 that. There's this this one aspect, like back in in 2021, when um, or I don't even remember anymore the exact dates when 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 some of these people tried to rebrand as leftists. The the thing that I kept hearing, which really aggravated me back then, was that everyone just blamed everything on Sargon, right? Everyone, everyone, every, almost every single anti SUW YouTuber who suddenly rebranded was like. No, Sargon made us do it. No, Sargon made us do it. And, and the thing that really stuck to me about that was it's not true. That's not what happened. Like, I was in, I was in Sargon's inner little DM group. He never told us to attack people. He never told us to go after someone. We, we all decided to do that ourselves. You know, we all did that ourselves. This is fundamentally our responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like 
I, I could make a comparison here, but before I do, I, I need to preface this one um, by saying that I'm not comparing Sargon to Hitler. Uh, <laughs> uh, if that, that's probably a weird preface to make, but um, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, uh, when when I because after the the thing in 2017, right? I I I studied IT starting in 2013, and then I'm after the the cancellation bullshit. I I sent back up to college. I mean, it's tuition free here, so <laughs> you can do it at any time when you want. I studied history, and um, the the preeminent historian on Nazi Germany, right, and on the rise of Nazism is a really base dude called um, Ian Kershaw. You might have heard of him. Um, he's like the preeminent historian of Nazi Germany. He's a British historian. He wrote like the, uh, he wrote a Hitler biography. It's quite the chunky fucking book. It's like 900 pages, but it's absolutely worth reading because it's, it's not as much, it's not just a biography of Hitler. It's also a, a text on how the Nazis came to power. It explains how the Nazis came to power. And, the the thing is like um historians of Nazi Germany, right? They face this really big problem in the um in the examination of the Nazi crimes, which is that in many cases Nazi war criminals didn't receive orders for the crimes they committed. They committed these crimes out of their own accord, right? Mm -hmm. Like for example, the gas chambers. There was never a top order to create the gas chambers. This is not, it wasn't envisioned at the top of the Nazi party. There was never a document or even a verbal order by Hitler to, that went down to the ranks, which said, okay, go build gas chambers. That never happened. It was doctors, ironically enough, who working out of their own accord came up with the idea that you could use gas chambers to mass murder thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of people. And Ian Crenshaw, like for historians, this is a problem um, to a degree. It's also not a problem because that fact of history proves that the line, you know, we were only obeying orders is a lie. They were not only obeying orders. They, they took deliberate initiative to commit mass murder. And Ian Crenshaw came up with this really great explanation in, in his amazing book, which he calls, he calls the concept working towards the Führer working towards Hitler. And the idea behind it is that, you know, the, the Nazi party outlined goals. It outlined ideological directives, which were clearly cast out, like, for example, the Jews must be exterminated. And then it encouraged the Nazi system, everyone who followed the ideology, everyone who was part of the state apparatus, the military apparatus and the SS, to take initiative to work towards the ideological goal. And this is how Crenshaw interprets and explains how the Nazi system worked, how it came to commit all these crimes, et cetera, et cetera. And this concept, this sort of working towards the Führer concept, right? The concept of working towards a goal. I do genuinely believe that, especially if you go in more gross corners of the internet or extremist corners of the internet that it applies here that you have people that you have outlined ideological goals outlined um standards and then everyone who is part of the group not because they're ordered to do it not because they're told to do it but out of their own initiative goes out there and works towards that goal and that is in my opinion very clearly what happened to us back then because nobody told us you know, nobody told, uh, I, I even forgot the names of some of the channels. Nobody told them to go out there, browse the internet and find like a little blog post of a 15 year old girl talking about feminism and then just make a video harassing her. Nobody told anyone to do that. That was initiative. That was something that they did out of their own accord. Nobody ordered them to do it. It was just, there was this print, there was this, not principle, but there was this ideological outline that was driven by people who sort of were big in their community, is that, yeah, these people are bad. It's okay to bully them. And then everyone went out there and out of their own initiative did that. I do genuinely believe that that is actually what happened, more or less. Yeah, it, uh, there's actually a... Um, I totally agree, and there's actually a word that got really popular uh, around the start of 2019 with a lot of video essays that describes exactly this. And I'm going to have to check out the, uh, the text you're talking about. 
Um, and it's called Stochastic Terrorism. Said, wait. You've probably heard of it. I'm going to... Wait. Wait. I have it here. Like, I keep reading this book over and over again. It's really good. But don't be scared of it. Like, it's chunky. Is it's there an really audiobook fucking... version? Because I can I grind through be. books with audiobooks playing games. Uh, if, like it, in the if there's an audiobook version, it's probably 30 minutes long. But, okay. you know, it, it says that it is a Hitler biography. And it is a Hitler biography. But it is far more than just a biography. Like, uh, I don't know if you... Just write it down. Ian Kersher. I-A-N-K-E-R-S-H-A-W. And the book is just called Hitler. And, and Ian Kersher is sort of the most preeminent... Like, he's the authority on the history of Nazi Germany right now, within our time. The historian on that. And it's okay. not just a biography of Hitler. It is a biography of Hitler. It tells you about his life. But it is also far more... It's an explanation of how Nazism took over Germany. All right. Yeah, and that's it, actually really you, useful. It's really good. Yeah, it's really worth a read. That actually <clears> kind <throat> of ties back into why I think so many people think of you as being like bread tube or just in that lefty sphere of content creation is because if you're somebody on the left, like I'm not super like I don't have a a a like core attachment to being on the left right like i'm not on the left because yeah. i'm on the left and that's where i'm supposed to be um i, I you know I, I went through a lot of reflection and and growth as a human being and politically to arrive where i am now i i, I used to be a little more left-leaning where i thought you know maybe some of these more radical theories are are practical and then i kind of got a bit older and more uh just became more aware of polling became more aware of just like the general life of living as an adult in america and you start you kind of get your political opinions tempered a little bit by real life and aging and maturing and because of that i i i found that like there's a lot of value being on the left and knowing as much info about history as possible history is like the best thing uh, tool of any progressive in my in my opinion if someone who genuinely is a truth valuing progressive uh, a historical knowledge is the best that you can get because I, I so often find myself learning about some historical event usually involving a fascist takeover of insert country and come to see very blatant parallels today um, good examples with the Nazis when they started banning any uh, content that included the I mean anything from including gay people if books were written by Jews if it had anything sexual in it they didn't like they called it degenerate art and they banned it they burned books they bur they they uh, you know took all of a uh, bunch of art and they put it into a display where they would look at it and it was a degenerate art display but they were also hating on it and destroying because they liked it but they didn't want to admit it. I don't know that, that there's <laughs> a lot of things where when when I went to to, to university that I learned that sort of like surprised me to a large degree. Yeah. Like when when you learn there there are narratives that we for example don't do anymore that are really um I have to like you probably heard the 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 Americanized uh, uh, narrative that like the thing that right wing America does where it says oh the Nazis were socialists you know where the Nazis were left wing right that's what I was taught and, when I was in school yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing about that is that is a narrative that was invented during the Cold War, basically by uh, political scientists. So sort of, uh, and, and the idea behind it during the Cold War was sort of, okay, there's ultimately no difference because they're both totalitarian regimes. So we equate them. So it, it was sort of a... a it, it really didn't have much intellectual merit to it, if I'm honest. And it was basically just a Cold War propaganda tactic. And these people didn't realize that that backfired because um, if you equate Nazi, like the equation of Nazism and communism, like the, putting them on the same level, this is not a political comment. This is a purely academic thing. I'm telling you that is really frowned upon by historians. That is that is a big no no. That is something that you just cannot do anymore these days, academically speaking. You would be laughed out <laughs> but the, the people who did this didn't realize that you can turn it around and there's a lot of leftist people who for example say oh wait you know the stalinists were actually right wing and stuff like that and that kind of equation thing is really frowned upon today so that narrative that you learned in high school that's something that is sort of being purged from the education sector because we acknowledge today that was incorrect another thing is um 
Did you learn in high school that the Nazis came to power because the German economy collapsed? Did you learn Eff that? Effectively, the story that I learned, and this is gonna, you're just going to be like burying your face in your hands here. This is the story we learned in, in school. Particularly, we really learned the most about World War II in middle school. So that even goes to show how limited what they were teaching us in the subject was. Essentially, World War I bankrupted Germany. Hitler was super populist and, and you know, used socialism to gain power. And the Nazi party was like a radical socialist party, kind of socialist. But it, it was really weird how they taught that the Nazis were socialists. Like, it left me with the impression growing up they were. But it, I don't know if it was, like, exactly stated. It was heavily implied that, like, if you go far enough on the socialist side of the political spectrum, you get to the Nazis was the, was yeah, the that, implication. That, that's, that's interesting. Like, like that narrative, right, that... Um... It was the economic troubles that caused the rise of the Nazis. That is also really frowned upon today. That is, it, it was also, it, it was actually, the author I mentioned before, the historian Ian Kersher, who sort of argued against this. And the reason why we actually don't teach that anymore, uh, or are supposed to not teach that anymore, is because it's, you're rationalizing the Nazis, right? You, you're depicting the rise of Nazism as a rational choice. And the thing that sort of completely debunks this entire narrative is fascism also came to rise in Italy, right? But Italy didn't lose the First World War. And also France and Britain both went through extreme economic turmoil in the 1920s. But fascism didn't come to power in France. It didn't come to power in Britain. It didn't come to power in Denmark or in Sweden or in Czechoslovakia, right? And th that's the reason why that narrative, this idea, this entirely materialistic econ uh, economic argument, right? That, oh yeah, bad economy, therefore Nazis. It's, it's a very stupid narrativization. It's a rationalization of how Nazis come to power that just shouldn't be done. It depicts choosing the Nazis to lead your country as a rational choice, which it is not, right? So that's why we no longer do that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I learned. I, I learned basically in that time that a lot of the stuff that we, a lot of the narratives that still persist in high school are way out of date and actually an uneducation and not an education. They're things that really have to go. And yeah. It's really worrying that you told me that you were taught in high school that the, the, well, the old narrative, the equation of Nazism of, and communism, that they're basically the same. That's really frowned upon in academia among historians that is something that you just can't do anymore well i mean that's a big part of why the american education system is so bad yeah. they will essentially uh sim they will lie about a topic to you when you're younger and then when you get a little older and they introduce you to the deeper version of that topic they tell you okay by the way we sort of totally lied to you as a kid um when you were younger about this thing it, it actually, that's not the case. Get ready, buckle up. You know, like a good example of this is in school. Uh, it, it, particularly, we we learned about uh, World War II in uh, middle school. They essentially taught us the Nazis politically. The vibe that they they gave us essentially from the lessons was that the Soviet Union and the Nazis were essentially equally bad and essentially the same thing, but just different aesthetics overall yeah. like different parts of the world different aesthetics different leaders different cultures like the vibe two sides of the same coin right so like if you go too far in one direction it horseshoes around into nazism but then if you go too far in the other direction it horseshoes around into like the soviet union's communism very that weird all, yeah. war perspective <laughs> you know yeah, that, that, that all comes out of like the definitions of totalitarianism, which were so popular in the 1950s and 1960s, where there was this excuse made. Like, I'm, I don't want to shit on her too much. Hannah Arendt is sort of the, the political scientist who sort of made the definition of what totalitarianism is, et cetera, et cetera. And even though she did not equate Nazism and communism, like when people read her book, The Origins of, Nazi, uh, of Totalitarianism, she very clearly outlines that there are differences, important differences between Nazism and Stalinism, right? But people just overlooked that. And they also overlooked like the other authors and researchers who did immense and important work on this matter. There's Juan Lintz, 
Nobody ever heard of Juan Lintz. Juan Lintz is um, a, a half Spanish, half German political scientist and historian who wrote books on like authoritarianism, and he focused heavily like on the on the study of Francoist Spain. And he outlined that the that there's an overuse of the word totalitarianism. That you also have to account for what authoritarianism is, and clearly define what authoritarianism is. And yeah. The Cold War da narratives that we spun up have done enormous damage, I think, to our education system, especially the equating of Nazis and communism. That has done. That's something that I learned when when I was still a student. It yeah. has done enormous damage doing that. Yeah, and, and we it's, miss a lot of people. It's weird because I feel like this one's going to be a, a weird culture shock thing. But here in America, at least when I was in middle school, there were two types of edgy kids you know mm -hmm. these are the kids whose entire personality is just trying to be special and edgy there were the kids who would be nazi larpers who were like so like super over the top racist and would be like haha hail hitler just kidding unless um mm -hmm. and then you had the kids who like wore yushankas to school and would be like oh yes hail stolen uh, and and would make memes about drinking vodka and their discord profile picture was the dog with the Yushanka hat and they like clearly they don't know it like they, they don't know what communism or socialism is they're just doing the the thing they're just doing like the aesthetic thing because they think it's like the other edgy thing than being like a Nazi LARPer Th those were the two types of kids at my school when I was younger I don't know if that's much of a thing I don't, I don't remember I don't remember any of that in my like the the thing that like i was taught the the innocent wehrmacht myth when i was in high school like that was still part of my curriculum that's how old i am but they the were idea just following that, orders no that the average that only the ss committed crimes oh the yeah the no. german army did not i was taught yeah. that when i was in high school you hear that a lot from mm -hmm. Americans to this day, but in like a weird softish way. Like they'll say, listen, I'm not saying that all the Nazis were just following orders or anything, but the SS were especially bad or whatever. They'll be like, well, okay, well, mm -hmm. I mean, the SS were pretty bad, but like, why are you implying that like the SS were the ones doing the really bad shit and it was just them? I've seen that from like... Not necessarily, like, in everyday life, but I'll just be chilling out watching, like, a random non-political podcast and, like, some historical talk will yeah, they, come they, up. They always, like, when you look deeper into it, they yeah. always point to, like, like uh, one of the fundamental, like, big problems was that um, when the Second World War ended, right, a lot of the German generals who surrendered to the Allies were sort of, they were hired by the United States to write books about how the war on the Eastern Front went, right? And they started writing like biographies, et cetera, et cetera, in the 1950s. And surprise, surprise, what they wrote was, we were good soldiers, but Hitler was a shitty commander. That, that is basically the gist of what they wrote, right? We were great soldiers. We would have won the war, but the Russian winter and um, et cetera, et cetera, which, and then in the, um, fuck, I'm trying to, to, to remember his name he's a military historian he used to be an american soldier Ooh. and when he ended his service in the u.s army he basically became an obsessive well obsessive is about where he became an expert on like military history of the second world war and he is the one who debunked that myth of the great german army he's the one who debunked it but i forgot his name uh, what was his name? Yeah, he, he sort of went to study this. But yeah, the, the innocent Wehrmacht myth has its origins in the 1950s. In when the, because the US hired these people to explain how the war went, because the US at the time thought that they were going to go have a war with the Soviet Union soon. And what the US didn't realize when they hired these people to um, write these biographies was that these people were, of course, biased. They wanted to persuade themselves in a positive light. Yeah, and I feel like one of the biggest... It's at, at one mm. point, at, at the same time, it's a struggle. And at the same time, it's also kind of a breeze that all it takes is a bit of expanded or, you know, corrected historical education for most people to move them over on their political beliefs. So it's, many it's people's... It's over-reliance on privacy. 
over reliance yeah. on private resources is just bad because this yeah. is something that came to be because people relied on like the first hand testimony of people. And the problem with first hand testimony of people is that of course they're going to be biased. Of course they're yeah. not going to like have <laughs> of course yeah. Yeah, and it's a big part of why I like your videos a lot, right? Like you do really well put together, well researched history videos. I just earlier today, um, before our convo, before stream, I was listening to your video on uh, European neutrality, and I learned a lot of really interesting shit. I had no idea that in in a bunch of neutral European countries, they can just get citizenship and travel to like hun over a hundred other countries without a passport in some cases or visa. Undecided. I think if you're a Swiss citizen, you can actually live in the United States visa free. Yeah, that, so, I, that's I yeah. didn't know about that. And and like for those of you guys who haven't seen that particular video, uh, Kraut's newest video, it was very very good. And um, yeah, you you, just, you you do great content on history, world politics, and foreign Thank policy you. and geography. And I learned. Stuff I'm very from it, hypercritical of my it. content in my community. I'm actually very hyper self critical about it. Like I obsess over finding mistakes. My my favorite video that I made is the Russia video that um, the origins of Russian authoritarianism and the really the only reason why I like that video is because it has the least amount of mistakes in it. That's actually like to give you an idea of what, what like my community is like the big topic of contention in my circle is um, mistakes. How do you deal with mistakes that you make in videos? That's that's something that we frequently discuss because. I've made some pretty, like the most embarrassing mistake I've ever made in a video is I'm, I made a, a, a long series of videos on like the relations between the US and Mexico and how the Mexican and American border came to be. And I had this sort of brain fart slip, Freudian slip in which I called Schumpeter a, a Marxist economist. And that is so fucking stupid because I know it's not true. I know that he's an Austrian economist, meaning he's a libertarian. So it's a really embarrassing fucking thing to say, but I still somewhat slipped and said that. I overlooked it in the editing and it's in the fucking video. And that's a, that, how to deal with things like that is a big point of contention in my community because we can't agree if like, okay, what do we do with this? Do we, after we made a video, do we list all the mistakes and then make another follow-up video where we talk about all the mistakes? Or do we once a year make a video which is just, here are all the mistakes that I made in videos over the last year? Or the, the, the solution that I came to is like a week or two after I publish a video, I usually make a community post and post a comment on the video with like, here's a list of all the mistakes I've made. Here they are listed up. Yeah, that, that, that's like the biggest point of contention in my community. Like, if you're not involved in any sort of YouTube drama shit like that, that's the kind of thing you care about in the end, I guess. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's it's really... I appreciate that there's so much thought and effort going into the, like, validity of the of the arguments and the actual truth behind it, right? Like, I'm, I'm really know... proud of my Russia video because I actually got emails from from professors at university who teach Russian history. Well, this is an excellent summary of like a semester of, like, I, I'm really proud of that video. Like in terms of factuality, accuracy, like very minor mistakes that I made. One actually very minor one, but I'm really proud of that one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to achieve that again. But nice. yeah, yeah, like, it's difficult though, and the longer a video is, the more likely you are to be making mistakes. To be honest, especially because if you'll dig into a topic, I I bet, and it'll be like, oh, I want to include this this interesting thing I've discovered after digging deep, deep, deep into this topic, and the more stuff like that you include, I feel the more likely you are to make a mistake, yeah. and I do that I, too. I, I... It's also like the, the getting lost in, in stupid, irrelevant shit. Um, I had a problem because I wanted to make um, a really long video about the history of the Netherlands. And I sort of got lost in making it to a absolutely ridiculous fucking point. I'm currently in the process of just throwing shit away. Uh, <laughs> I, I made like, um, I wrote like four pages because... Um, uh, I wrote four pages about why sand is bad for agriculture and why you can't grow wheat on, uh, on, on sandy soil. 
because that is a problem that the Dutch had uh, when it became an agricultural, when the first agricultural societies developed there, that the, the soil was too sandy to do good agriculture, so they had to specialize in trade. And I, I just realized, why the fuck did you spend four pages on this nonsense? Why did you make this a big part of the video? This is just completely, this is just completely nonsensical. <laughs> It's, See, it's very even, difficult to tell when it is too much or not. Now my yeah. fans know that even in prepared scripted content, stun locks happen. They're unavoidable. You have to be really careful when you make long videos because, I mean, you're a streamer. You will fuck up and you have a right to fuck up because you're doing this off the cuff, right? I don't have that excuse. Because I have to sit down, I have to record, I have to think carefully about what I say, I have to think carefully about what I write, record, and how I edit it, etc., etc. If I make a mistake, it's more embarrassing for me than it would be for you. Uh, for, for someone who makes YouTube videos, fuck-ups are far more embarrassing. So th it's, it's wise to be careful about these things. Yeah. yeah, I get really embarrassed if I have, like... For example, I'll mispronounce, even if it's mispronouncing something, but certainly if I get someone's name wrong or like I'll, I'll have an embarrassing American geography education moment where it'll be like, okay, let me find this country on the map. Give me a second, chat. Yeah. Give me a second. Give, I'm, I'll find it. It's I'll okay find to it. do <laughs> it's, it's perfectly okay to do this with streamers. I think people yeah. underestimate how hard this shit is. Like, I tried to stream a few years ago, and it didn't work out. I think people don't realize that streaming is actually a skill. The ability to off-the-cuff entertain people live with no recourse, like no ability to sit back and sort of plan things out more carefully. It is a skill, and it is a skill that is hard to earn and learn. And, yeah, I think people underestimate how hard it is. I, People also underestimate it, how hard it is to make videos, though. I have to say that. <laughs> as someone who's done both, because I used to do prepared content, the prepared content's harder. It just is. Um, and, and I have more respect, like, for the content. Like, not, like, lack of respect for other people's content. More like I have more appreciation for the amount of work, the sheer level of work that goes into... A video like for example i've got a video essay in my recommended right now um that's like it, it's about how uh the return of bison could transform europe and it's 20 minutes long but i know just from the thumbnail the editing the script that i can see just from hovering over the video and seeing the the text dialogue i can tell that this video probably had months of work put into it and it's 20 minutes long and it's like that's more work than goes into a stream. But then on the other hand, there are things about streaming that are like tough. Like for example, like throughout the day, it just happens. You get hit with like waves of nausea. You just don't feel so good. And you're just like, oh, I need to take a breath for a second. When you're a streamer, you gotta fight through that shit. There's been like five times throughout this combo where I've been like, ooh, I feel so, I just feel nauseous that's all that's of a sudden. Really I gotta thing. sit back for a second. Like there is a, a streamer who I know. The one thing he constantly complains about is that um, that um, his camera keeps overheating, and I, and we I, I kind of bully him with this because I I know I'm showing my face to you right now. I have two webcams. It's very easy to to get out of this thing. You just buy two webcams and you can switch between the two when one overheats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to do that too. Weird yeah, that that's just the buy reason. A second what... webcam. Yeah. That's the reason I don't have my webcam on right now on Discord is because it doesn't like like Discord and OBS won't let you use the same camera for both those things at once. So like I'd have to turn off my camera on o on uh, OBS. That's just three clicks. Stuff. If you're too lazy to do three clicks, <laughs> that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I well, my goal is actually what I'm going to do is use this current camera as my Discord camera pretty soon, and I'm going to buy a proper DSLR like a Sony digital camera that I can use for vlogging stuff because I want to mm -hmm. do more IRL content, particularly at the range. I want to do some gun content, and um, on top of that, I want to do uh, like just you know higher quality streams. You know, just have my my face be a little bit higher def. I also yeah, gotta I'm, get some entirely sure how to expand from i'm trying to teach myself new styles of animation right now that's oh, like hell what yeah. i'm doing 
I'm too fat to be on camera, so I have to. I'm a chubby boy. I need to to lose more weight before I can actually show myself. So I'm, yeah, I'm trying to gain weight. More. I'm in the opposite boat. I got COVID really bad, and it it, it just like destroyed my appetite. Mm. And and I was also like going through some like extremely busy shit at that time too. So I wasn't eating as much anyway. And I just ended up it's a, losing it's a, a ton it's a, of weight. It's a it's a different thing for me. Like um. Everyone who's ever had an online hate mob directed against them develops some sort of ha nasty depressive habit. Like I've talked to a couple of people, like they, there are people who become opioid addicts after they've been canceled. There are people who start drinking heavily. And mine is I started depressive eating. <laughs> <laughs> and I have never, like I can't, I, I don't talk about these personal issues to my audience and I would never bring it up. But I know that your audience probably doesn't overlap largely with mine so I can talk about it. But yeah, that's a habit that I developed. When I feel really depressed, which happens unfortunately every few months, happens to everyone who's gone through something like this, I just stuff myself with pizzas and shit, and I bloat up really badly, and then I have to sort of, then I feel like shit because I did that, and I have to sort of try to get rid of it. So that's the issue that I have there. I'm just, a, I, I developed sort of a depressing eating habit. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. I Well, I mean, at the same time, well, It's better though, than being... Yeah. an alcoholic or a heroin addict like there are people who've been about worse i guess yeah it's it's one of those things like I, I don't think most people can even comprehend what it's like to just wake yeah. up one morning and be reminded tens of thousands of people that you don't know hate you hate you yeah it's like it, you know, like you'll just be at the beach or something just doing something out in the world and the thought will hit you like statistically it's, it's not really the fault what like, if one of those it, people is here you know like you'll think about that like yeah you know once a, it, it, yeah sorry you good it, it sucks the joy out of things if you think yeah. like once you start thinking about it yeah it, it's i have to be honest it's one of the reasons why it takes me so long to make videos yeah for... uh, it, it, it happens to everyone as far as i know everyone who goes through this i've talked to like a handful of people who've gone through this before like it, it becomes really difficult to make videos after you've been through it because it, yeah. you just don't, I don't know, the, the joy of making videos is kind of crushed to a degree. You don't want to, you do enjoy it once it's up, but the process of doing, of working on it has, becomes this really worrisome, nasty thing. Yeah. Yeah, like, I can totally, mm. no, you go ahead. I, I well I, I was gonna say I, I can totally relate to that because a large part of it and I think a big part of it is also when content creation becomes your job whatever aspect of the content creation that you were really passionate about when you started then starts to become a matter of like okay so it's not I'm inspired to do this video it's like well I need it, food it's in the well studied. <laughs> you know I think it's like, not well studied it, it, it's an understudied thing. I don't think that a lot of therapists really know what it is. It's not yeah. something that we have really figured out re yet. Like, I have no idea what goes with it, on with me in that regard. There are just, like, two, three, four times. I went, like, to be quite honest with you, I went through something like this again last month. You just don't want to do it. You just feel miserable. And in my case, I just order pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> I eat pizzas. I feel sorry for myself until I finally get out of this. And I don't know what it is. I've never been to a therapist. I should probably go at one point. But I know that there are more people who, when they go through something like this, they develop sort of, they develop the same thing. Yeah. Like PTSD from stuff like this is pretty common. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's you know it, it can it can fuck with a lot of people for me my way of uh dealing with it is that um i, I i've always been a very thick skinned person because i came from a really rough uh, uh upbringing in some respects you know like mm. me and my mom and you know didn't get along too well and so i was very used to having the most horrific and i learned so many of the most vile insults you can imagine from things my mom said to me as a young child and so like i'd really become steeled to like insults and shit talking even if it's from somebody that like i care about like my mom 
uh, just as like sort of a, a naturally developed skill. And to the point where I started to turn people doubting me or people hating mm -hmm. on me into spite fueled motivation. Um, I got nothing but pushback from my mom when I said I wanted to be a YouTuber and do this for a living. And here I am now doing it successfully in large part because every time my mom said that I couldn't do it, I was more motivated to prove her wrong. Dude, yeah. And when I get haters, when I get people who shit talk me, I'm motivated to stream. So my social blade goes up. My social blade, I know they're watching because I know they're going to see that plus 100, plus 200, plus 300 subs, however many I gain. And I know they're going to be mad. And that's what brings yeah. me joy. That's my copium. That's that's not something that I got, to be honest. Like, after... Like, the, the thing with with what happened to me was also, like... Like, for two years, I obsessed about getting revenge against the people involved in what happened to me. I really wanted to get to them. And with some of them, I have to be honest, I sort of succeeded. But you realize... Once you're at that point, you realize that hurting the people who hurt you doesn't, it doesn't bring back the sort of serene mental state that you had before. It doesn't yeah. help you. It doesn't really. And, and I, I then went for sort of a phase where I had to reckon with the fact that, you know, I used to do this too to people. Like, I'm not someone who can ride around on a high horse here. You know, that, that is something that I had to reckon with, that in my com some of my community still are sort of like from the old core, these sort of disillusioned Sargon fans who left that sphere together with me when I was kicked out. But we had to sort of reckon with the fact that, yeah, we used to do that to people. We can't really, we can talk about experience to a degree, or I can at least, but we can't really make moralizing statements about it. Like, yeah. No, totally. Yeah. I, I, I think what you've done is really healthy, if I'm being honest, because there's no, I mean, there, well, there, well, there, like, to, I, I know there's some downside. There's, it's not perfect, but at the same time, you've gotten out of this toxic fucking sphere. You've made your own community. I didn't. That's own... the that's the funny thing. I was kicked out. That is like. Well, well, it, well, but it's, yeah. Well, they well being in the like the can like when they were canceling you and attacking you and harassing you and try like trying to ruin your life after they kicked you out. That was being in it, you know. But you got mm. out of it, you know. You've got your own carved out niche of of content. Like you've you've like ballooned in growth. Like the I see your videos. The experience, the experience does shape a lot of what we do. Like it, um... it does. Let me, let me flatter you for a moment. Let me flatter you for a moment. Okay. I see your videos and my recommended all the time. Your videos get pushed by YouTube hardcore. You've got good thumbnails and appealing titles. The content is good. Your haters are fucking seething. Um, and I feel like you, you don't... The fact that you don't even know about like a lot of the drama that's happened in this sphere tells me you are, at the very least, in an environment that is so much more healthy than the average, uh, I guess, figure in More of a the self -restraint online content. Thing. Yeah. I have to be honest with you. It is a self-restraint thing. I do sometimes get the inch to go after people, stuff like that. Like it, it's what I used to, not that much anymore. Like I think in twenty twenty, maybe twenty twenty one. Like I, I'm still the biggest creator in my group. The the second biggest Ravigno only has like thirty thousand subscribers. Even though I'm pushing him hard, he does not a lot of people watch him, unfortunately. But it's like, yeah, but we we sort of had sort of like a learning thing. Like we we after we were done with sort of the skeptic autopsy thing, where we looked back and looked at the mistakes that we made and why everything was so bad. We we all sort of. We sat down and we wrote a document, which might sound a bit cringy, um, which is rules, rules for ourselves, basically. How we expect, so standards that we set for ourselves as creators. And we, we mapped out rules to, for ourselves, like, for example, no attack videos. Nobody in our community ever gets to attack anyone. No response videos, no attacking other creators, no videos which are about attacking other creators even if they are wrong no matter how wrong they are even if they attack you you don't get to attack others 
um, the, that, that's one of the rules that we, for example, set up for ourselves uh, and stuff like that. Or another rule that we set up is make, admit to mistakes. And we basically, yeah, that's basically the foundation of what we do in, in my community. And what if I do? It's basically not as much, it's practicing self-restraint, more or less. Because the thing about staying out of drama, right? It's not that you want to prevent people attacking you because that's going to happen no matter what you do on the video. It's the restraint to not respond, the restraint to not lash out back. That is the really hard part to learn. That when someone says something negatively to, uh, negative about you, that you don't have this sort of monkey brain reaction of him. Oh, I'm going to get you. You, you. Learning not to take it personal, learning to just, okay, just because someone bad said, someone said something bad about you, it doesn't mean that you have to be nasty back. That was a really, that was something hard to learn. That was something, yeah. Which I, I mean, did eventually. Though. <laughs> that's an extremely mature mindset. I feel like you mentioned before that therapists are just not qualified to deal with the kind of shit your average content creator who's been under a harassment campaign has been through. But I feel and like I'm if they were, not they'd recommend that. I'm not, saying I'm not saying they're not qualified. I'm just saying that they that this is a new thing and it's probably not as it, well understood yeah, like, yet. Like, it's not as well yeah. researched, you know? Like, I, I know that a lot of YouTubers that I personally know have had to go through a cycle, a merry-go-round of different therapists that just weren't right for them until they found one that was, like, generally young enough to have some knowledge of, like, generally somebody who works with a lot of people who have, like, social media presences and, and is younger and, and knows about that stuff usually ends up being the ideal therapist from what I've heard. But, like, yeah, you're, you're completely right about that. I haven't gone to therapy it, myself by the way it's but, yeah. it, it it the, those rules are by the way the reason why i don't promote a lot of other creators because basically everyone who reaches out to me and it's like hey can we collab can we would you promote me i i show them that document and say you have to agree to every single piece of that that's the only condition under which i will promote someone <laughs> so, oh shit yeah. i've wrote that's myself into I the did. agreement <laughs> with this with this combo you have not no, no, no. I, I mean, I'm happy with going on here and talking about these things with you because I know that, like I said before, like only like 10 to 15 percent of my audience watches BreadTube. So, you know, I can talk about things with you here. I have to really honestly tell you the fact that I rebuilt something, that I built something outside of this sphere is really helped me a lot in being able to reflect more and be more objective about everything that happened because you don't feel attached anymore. I certainly don't feel as attached anymore. And when you don't feel attached to that sphere anymore, you can just be more blunt about things. Yeah. You're free. Far more You're, blunt. It feels I am. Free. I am. The, the worst thing that someone who doesn't like you can do to you on the internet is say nice things about you. And I know this sounds weird, but I can explain. Like, have you, have you ever noticed that everyone who Keemstar ever ruined is someone who Keemstar helped build? That there's a process to what he does, that he shouts people out, he helps build their channels, and then he cancels them because he shares an audience with these people, so he knows he can always take it away. The more you share an audience with someone, the more of a risk there is that that people, the more you give power to that person to ruin you at any given point. That's basically what happened to me. My audience, when I was an anti-SJW YouTuber, wasn't technically my audience. It was Sargon's audience. And when I was no longer useful to him, he decided to take it away from me, right? So I can talk more openly to you and to anyone else in that sphere now because... There's nothing you can do to me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, uh, I know yeah. what you mean. Well, like, yeah. the, the way I see it is like you've, you've freed yourself from the, the unhealthy cycle of having to even really care that much. I mean, I'm sure you care to a degree, but like, when you, when you don't, when you use the restraint, you start to not care. I guess I could pull from a personal example. I don't think example. that's really it. I don't think, like, oh. the, it's, there's other things as well. Like, I do, like, beginning in what I did in the rebuilding phase, I, I genuinely started to believe that most of social media interaction is basically monkey see, monkey do. 
that the way we behave as creators online is emulated by the people who watch us. That if you are an aggressive dipshit who just attacks, 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 attacks people or bullies people, you will build a community of bullies. You will build an audience of bullies. Your audience will be bullies precisely because you are a bully on social media. And it was very, I, I genuinely believe that, right? And that is why I tried really, really hard throughout the last few years to avoid this type of behavior on my channel as much as I can, because I genuinely believe that if I didn't do any of this, I would attract an audience of people who would also not do this and would sort of emulate that behavior, right? Yeah. And I had a really disappointing moment, um, a really, really fucking disappointing moment last year where there is a, a YouTuber who I really, really enjoy, right? We, we, I, I have to lay out the field here, right? Like, um, in my community, a big point of contention is the role that we wrote down, which the rule that we wrote down, which is no response videos. Because even a lot of friends of mine, most of them actually, they think that is wrong, that there should be response videos, right? That we should be able to argue with other creators, but we don't know how. And we, we, we had conversations about this in, in the sense of like, okay, if we're going to do that in any way, we have to find a way to do it that is friendly, polite, forthcoming, that is non-aggressive, right? Because if you go and watch response videos on YouTube, most of them are wrecked, debunked, owned, pawned, all this nonsense. And we had conversations about, okay, if we're going to do response videos, we have to do them in a way that we don't fall into this kind of behavioral pattern, that we don't go out there and bully people, that we don't insult people. And um, I'm aware of three videos that were made in response to me over the course of the last three years. There's one guy, he was really funny. He's sort of this right-wing libertarian. He made two videos about me, which I watched. And, <laughs> and I, well, I, I said I watched. I watched the first five minutes of one of his videos because he literally begins the video with the sentence, I didn't watch his video, but here's a response to it, which is a nonsensical statement. And I didn't, like, I just laughed and I closed down his video and didn't watch the rest of it. But I was told by friends that this was video, this crowd is an idiot, crowd owned, crowd wrecked, etc. So I cut that one out. I thought, okay, I can't use this guy to sort of try and experiment because it will just be a bullying insult fest. I can't do that. And the thing that happened last year, which was really disillusioning to me, was there's a YouTuber who I really, really admire called Vlad Flexler. He's a, a Russian in exile. He lives in Britain. He's a philosopher. He makes really excellent videos. He's really great. And to my pleasant surprise, he made a response video to me, which I watched because I happened to be subscribed to him and his second channel, and I really love his content. And that was, it ticked all the boxes of what I had imagined. His response video to me was no insults, zero things that are condescending, nothing that could ever fall into any sort of bullying behavior politely expressed points of critique of a video that I had made about the ideologies within the Putin regime in Russia. And he critiqued that and he outlined, yeah, I think you're wrong, that ideology is not that much of an important factor here, etc., etc. I And I still admire your video. I still like the work you did. I think you were right on these points and that point. And it was, it was from my perspective like the ideal right this is something that i had envisioned in my mind and i was so happy when he did that because i thought fuck yeah this is what i want maybe now i can make a response video to him and i'm going to do like this politely expressed disagreement just like he did and i shouted out his response video to me on my channel because i wanted people to watch this because i thought okay since i believed back then that people em emulate the behavior of the creators they watch that okay they might be polite here as well so i shouted out his video and the the moment was was really fucking disappointing to me was that even though it was this polite discourse this polite exchange members of the audience on their own behalf went into this attack mode, went into this like wrecked, owned, pawned, go, spill blood, fight, 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 attack, attack, attack. They called for that. I genuinely believed a few years ago that most of what we have right as creators on YouTube is like the 
our audiences emulate our behaviors and that they act in accordance to how we behave and that if we just do an extra effort into being as polite and as nice as possible that they just won't do that it was really disheartening to see that no there are people on the internet who will do this shit out of their own accord they will go out there and try to get you to attack people they will go out there and try to instigate fight they will go out there and try to instigate the sort of nasty behavior on their own behalf without there being a creator who necessarily pushes any of this so yeah it, it, it's still a point of contention in my community we just don't know if there even is a solution to this problem because there, there is really even like we thought for a long time that there is no nice way to do a response video and we kind of still believe that because even if you're super polite and super friendly there is a segment of the online environment just just doesn't want to accept that that doesn't want to accept polite disagreement that doesn't want to accept the fact that people can disagree that just calls consistently for this type of behavior and yeah, I, I don't know the solution to this. Like the, the thing that we do right now is just we just very strictly follow the rule that no attacks. That's what we enforce on ourselves. You don't attack it's, other creators ever. It's period. really it's really respectable. And I feel like for me, I, I've kind of been in a similar arc that was kind of enforced on me by getting banned from Twitter. It's like mm -hmm. I don't even know if or when I'm getting attacked on Twitter. And even if I was, or I find out that I am, I'm like, oh, maybe I should talk about that on stream for a second. And by the time stream happens, I've totally forgotten about it. It just, it doesn't weigh on my mind. Um, I feel like the more attention you give some of these things, the more power you can give it. But then at the same time, there are definitely some instances where you got to respond, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Like there personal are attacks. problems. Yeah. Well, not just personal attacks. Like, I'm willing to actually make a bet that within the next five years, someone on YouTube is going to be sued for false pedophilia accusations. Because just how widespread it is at this point, it, it, it's basically, like, I remember even back in 2016, 2015 era, right? This shit was everywhere. Even back in 2010, I remember these being made. And 29. Like... And I genuinely believe that this type of behavior, like I genuinely believe that we're reaching a boiling point because there's so frequent false pedophilia accusations and stuff like that, that someone is going to eventually be sued and someone has to be sued who does that. So it finally fucking ends, right? Yeah. Because it's just so widespread. It's really, yeah. <laughs> we still, like, I know that a lot of the idiots who, from the 8chan and 4chan days keep saying that oh the wild west days of the internet are over that's not true there aren't really any institutional structures of rules there are no formal rules like the only rules that there are the ones that we enforce on ourselves it's the standards that we hold ourselves to that really are the only thing that matters online and because of that because this still is to a degree a space without standards people do horrific things to each other yeah yeah and it's just toxicity is the name of the game on the internet you like it's almost like a natural Not for me yeah Not well for me. Especially yeah this shit. <laughs> you, you, you've transcended i actually i respect the hell out of it i um yeah. i think this conversation has been like really really interesting I, I know that a lot of people in chat at first there were people here that were somewhat I have to be skeptical honest with you. but I have everyone here's happy I, I have to be honest with you, like, I, I, the reason why, it's also sort of a thing that, um, I don't really, like, I, I wouldn't talk with my audience about this, but it's like, after my cancellation, I acquired a really weird habit, a sort of compulsion, which is, every time I notice that another creator has been cancelled, I write them an email. I don't, that's just something that I, I it, it's really something that I barely have. It, it, I, I, I don't know how to explain this, right? It's, it's just the one thing that I remember that really burned itself into my memory from my cancellation was just the, 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 the complete desolation and loneliness. Like suddenly nobody talks to you anymore. You're completely alone. You're gone. Everything is taken from you. Everything is over. 
and that that feeling is something that I really it it brings up a sense of dread in me whenever it comes up. And every time, like, yeah, like every time I I, I noticed that someone was cancelled, I sort of I developed this compulsive behavior where I write them an email going like, "Hey, everything's fine. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. This is not the end of the world." Because I know that this is the kind of thing that I really desperately wanted back then when it happened to me. And that, if I can be blunt to you, is one of the reasons why I sort of deliberately disconnected myself from all of this. Why I don't watch, not just, I never really watched much Bread Tube anyway, but when the drama really started kicking up, I didn't know that it was as bad as your editor told me recently but when i started noticing drama happening more and more there i had to stop watching because i have this compulsive behavior develop in me I'm, I'm not going to go into details but i know that there is a a bread tuber who got cancelled in your sphere whom i wrote an email like that and there's also i had to watch stop watching commentary youtube because i kept doing that and that's also a reason why i had to stop it, it it's more like a I had to stop watching this and watching any sort of this drama, disconnecting myself from that because I kept doing that thing. I, it became embarrassing to me that I kept doing this because I didn't understand why I kept doing this, this sort of weird, compulsive, reactive behavior that I developed out of that, which I really don't understand. Yeah. Like every time I see YouTube drama, I get sort of, I don't know, like, I get this weird semblance of memories from back then when it happened to me. And it's really uncomfortable. So just for that reason alone, I have to stop watching spheres where drama happens, which are toxic, I guess. Yeah. It, just, it just gives you, yeah, it just fucks with you. I completely understand it. And I respect the fact that you've, you've gone so far as to write out an outline um, and have disciplinedly stuck to it as well as you have. Um, it, it, well, it's I, I should tell you, like, I have a private Twitter account that nobody follows where I still rage around like a lunatic. <laughs> so I do have that outline. Nobody knows Grace. what that account is, which is great. But and I'm a you fucking never will. Lunatic. Yeah. <laughs> it's private. It doesn't have it, barely any followers. Only my best friends whose job is to tell me when I go too far, basically. <laughs> Yeah, if I yeah. if I still had it, if I I'll tell you guys this chat. If I had a secret Twitter account, I was still using. Still, I don't. It would just be me tweeting boobs, butts, boobs, butts, and every other day it's. I it's haven't a different tweeted tweet. in. I haven't tweeted anything or been on Twitter in like weeks because the place has gone to shit ever since Musk took it over. It's really you should be happy that you're banned. Oh yeah, I got like it's like getting um. It's like getting, like, in a movie where one of those cinematic scenes happen where a character gets, like, they're, like, on a boat and the boat's going to explode and they would die if they were on the boat during the explosion, but the shock wave knocks them off into the water and they miraculously are okay. That was that was what happened to me with all that do you with have Twitter. Um, you have I do, yeah. 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 I have one, too, but I, I keep forgetting to use it. Same. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I do uh, code giveaways, but a big part of it is that with it still being like such a lockdown platform, it's so hard. Like one of the best things about making a tweet is like on Twitter prior to Elon Musk buying it, I could tweet windy today and I'd get like 500 replies from my fans talking about the weather where they are. But on blue sky, it's like I'll tweet something and it will get no interaction. And it's like, well, I wasn't doing it for likes. I was doing it for comments that are interesting to read. And now there's none of those. So I just post a lot less uh, on, on Blue Sky. I'm, I'm waiting for it to open up fully, and I'll probably go a lot harder on there. I haven't gotten into well, I, just, I, I just I just came out of a month of feeling miserable and sorry for myself and eating pizzas all the time, and now I'm in panic mode because I have to finish a video. So I don't really have time to even post a Blue Sky or anything like that. I really, really need to finish a video this month. I'm sort of putting pressure on me to get that one fucking done. <laughs> like desperation yeah. is always the best motivator. You always end no. up getting it done. No interest, <laughs> interest, genuine interest is the best motivator. But if you procrastinate to the last minute, then you have no choice but to get it done quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Procrastination well, logic's nah. not healthy, guys. Seriously. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, overall, this has been a fantastic convo. Is there anything else you want to go over? I don't know if there's anything. Like, yeah. 
I, I, I guess like it, the thing that was like I, I noticed like it's not a lot of people but it's just a few dozen who sort of have the expectation that there's still this like raging animosity between us but you know yeah. it's been three years it's almost four years now <laughs> if, if there was still like Cherry asked me what in the corners of the internet where I hang out what people think of US fear and the, the 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 opinion that I mostly get about Vouch and his immediate um, circle is that you guys are basically the only part of BreadTube that isn't pro-Russian, <laughs> which is <laughs> <laughs> because most of my audience is European. It, it's there's this weird competition between, like, in my analytics, um, forty to forty-five percent of my audience are Europeans. And the second largest viewing demographic is um, is interestingly a competition between Americans and Asians, which is very weird to watch. <laughs> yeah, it's like always this like, yeah, I have a lot of subscribers for the from from the Philippines for some reason, which I can't really don't yeah. know how or why. Yeah. Oh, pro probably because the politic, like the government of the Philippines, is very uh, authoritarian and right wing. Up. So like there's yeah. a, I, I have a few friends that are in the Philippines and they're like a, a pretty much everybody who's like 20s and younger in the Philippines is pretty aggressively left wing. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's just a pretty massive Zoomer Filipino left wing audience online. Would be, yeah. They're also sort of I had a conversation with one of my uh, Taiwanese viewers. And the, the way he explained it to me was that um, he also sent me a political science book because he's a political science student himself, which the explanation that he gave was in East Asia, we used to be mostly dictatorships right up to the 1990s and 1980s. Like Indonesia was a, a dictatorship until 98, Philippines until, I wouldn't get it wrong, 94. Uh, South Korea was a dictatorship until 1989. So all these places used to be neoliberal dictatorships where the social contract basically revolved around, okay, you can do business, but you can't be political. You can't have opinions. You can't do activism. And that collapsed by the 90s. And then you had the establishment of sort of political parties. And the way he explained it to me was is the current generation, young generation of people in Taiwan, in South Korea, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, they're sort of one of the first generation that is truly free to explore political ideas. That you could, for the, they're the first generation that is allowed to go out and, I don't know, for example, read Marxist literature without the secret police coming in to arrest you. Or be free to explore political concepts from throughout the world, from out various schools of thought, et cetera, et cetera. And because they are the first who are free to do this, there is this sort of massive interest in political history, political science, in studying various different ideologies and schools of thoughts now in various East Asian countries, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in South Korea, and in Taiwan. Yeah, that's how he explained it, at least to me. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been thinking about lately, especially getting more more of my content uh, to appeal to that broader demographic. That's not just people who are in like America and a bit of Europe. Most of my audience is um, American, followed by Canadians, followed by Australians, and then British people. And then um, I have a lot of Mexican. I have a lot of Mexican yeah. subscribers. I also have a lot of Mexican friends. Yeah. I've, I have quite a f yeah, Mexico's fairly high up on the list. A surprising one as well was the Philippines too, which is what made, why I wasn't surprised to find out you have a very large Filipino audience. Um, another one that surprised me was um, Brazil. Brazil was really high on the list. That was a surprising one to me. I don't know why. Yeah. I just didn't expect to see it like seventh or sixth on the list, you know, of, of the most common... Uh, you know, for people. me, the big surprise are the, are the Filipinos and the Indonesians. A lot of Filipinos and Indonesians watch my videos. Yeah, there are also it's... segments that I try to avoid. I have to be very frank about this. Um, 
This is something that a, uh, a Indian friend of mine told me, like after I made a, a video that was related to a topic to India, he sort of implored me never make any videos relating to India ever again. Um, I don't know if this is true. He told me that Indian YouTube is currently and Indian social media is currently going for a sort of anti SJW phase of sort, and that it's extremely toxic and that there's a lot of like Hindu nationalist viciousness all throughout it. It's a weird thing to say, but he told me that you should try to avoid the attention of like this really toxic Hindu nationalist crowd, which is very dominant in Indian social media. That's at uh, least something yeah. that he told me. I mean, that that is that is going to be like a massive uh, issue when you consider the fact that like the Internet's only going to become more and more accessible. And there are a lot of nations that are going to be getting Internet access where a pretty significant amount of the population holds horrific beliefs politically by the standards of the rest of the world, pretty much. And it's just going to be like, how interesting is the Internet political dynamic going to be when we've got like we've got like nationalists from India and we've got nationalists from yeah. Russia and we've got nationalists from China and we've got nationalists from Japan and we've got nationalists from Canada. Yeah. We've got, it's oh, it's going to be awesome. Fuck. Fuck. I, I fucking despise Japanese nationalists. They are some of the most vicious fuckers on the internet. Oh when yeah. You get, oh, and when, the things when you get their attention. They're just like, they're cruel, vindictive, nasty, persistent people. They're, they're also just really awful. Like I think, like if I if I look back to the past few years, the 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 incidents that I had where I riled up a group of people who sort of tried to harass me, like it it it, it was no sort of cancel culture American culture war bullshit. The two groups who really tried to get rid of me were Japanese nationalists. Like if you say anything about Japanese war crimes or acknowledge that Imperial Japan committed war crimes they will rage at you for weeks. And the other group were uh, Serb nationalists. Say anything about the Bosnian genocide and they will harass you for months. And they don't, they don't stop. That's the thing. Like there is an entire segment of like Serb nationalists and Serb communists, interestingly, who hate my guts just because I acknowledge that the Bosnian genocide happened. <laughs> it's, it's really, really weird. That's always yeah. when you know you're dealing with uh, just a weird, like a crowd of people that you do not want to give any quarter to in regards to like, maybe they have a point, yeah. is when you talk about a genocide and they're getting mad at you about it and saying, well, you're actually, it's more complicated than that. Because every time I've gone down that road, whether it be with the Holdemer whether it be like back in my chuddy right wing phase when I was a teenager with like the Holocaust and, and the rise of like fascism in Italy. Um, it's always some it, it's like it's, it's a it's bit more closer to me because yeah. when I was a student, that was sort of my one of the things that I was like specializing in and studied in was the Bosnian genocide. So I wrote papers on it and with the thesis, level, like my thesis on it was like that the Bosnian genocide proves that we didn't uh, learn the lessons that we should have learned from the Holocaust. I went there, I met people, survivors, etc. The mass graves are still there. That you, you still find human remains um, on the roads leading to the massacre sites. You still fish up. There's a, um, there's a site they visit, a, a bridge across the river where in 1994, Serb militias gathered together all the women and children, cut their throats and threw them off the bridge into the river beneath it. I think it was the Drino River. And they're still collecting bodies down because the, the bodies got all swamped up in a hydroelectric dam down the river. And the, the reason why I'm a bit more pernicious when it comes to the people who denied that, when it comes to like the, the Serb nationalists, the Serb communists who deny what happened in Bosnia is the Bosnian genocide is still an event in living memory. This is not something that is like half a century or longer in the past. This is something that is 20, 30 years ago. The people who survived that still live among us. They are still survivors here. They, they still have vivid memories. They have, you know, they, they know exactly what happened. Um, if, and the people who deny these events are basically people who also live through it because it's an event that is in their living memory as well. So I'm especially 
it, it's, it's a reason why people noted uh, to me that I keep making deliberate statements to provoke, especially like the Serb genocide denier types, be they right wing or left wing, because to me it is particularly offensive that these people engage in this behavior because it is also in their living memory. This is something that happened when they were still around. This is something where the consequences are still not fully understood or fully examined because it's still something that is lived. Genocide doesn't end just when the killing ends, right? An unwanted people, um, genocide is predicated on the fact that you try to exterminate an unwanted people. And to a large extent, a people unwanted remain unwanted even after the mass killing ends. Um, a majority of Bosnians don't live in Bosnia. They live in the Netherlands, Germany, etc., etc. And they still have to live with the stigma of being the unwanted people who, where an attempt at extermination was made against to them. So I, I have very little patience um, for the type of person who denies what happened there, for the type of person who just spins really gross narratives about what happened there. It, 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 it does actually kind of get under my skin, I have to admit to that. I, I get that because like I've gotten to be the same way with Ukraine because like well the Bosnian genocide is not something that I'm all that familiar with just because of you know when I got into politics and like how like where I've where my experience is at the moment um, with Ukraine which is something I've covered quite closely and watched quite closely no like watching as all of the experts came to an overwhelming conclusion that Russia was going to invade. I, I should, I should so, clarify to you, yeah. the, the, the rumor that I heard that you're the only part of BreadTube that is not pro-Russian, that is just something I heard. I don't know if that's actually true, and I don't want to get involved well, in any sort of drama. Uh, that, you can't. At, at the end of the day, honestly, it's not too bad of a, of a, of a uh, assessment. Right now, the big schism between, like, if you want to call it BreadTube, you can, is... Um, You've got the side calling themselves Cornbread Tube, which at the what? core, I'll explain it in a minute. It makes it makes no sense even when you know why. But um, they call themselves Cornbread Tube. We used to call them woke scolds. It doesn't really what? matter what you want to call them. What 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 wokes? The the wokes? idea prior to woke the scolds. What does that even mean? Prior to to the adaption of the term woke as being this uh, d like dog whistle word for anything bad in the minds of conservatives, usually meaning like brown people being in a movie or something. Um, prior to that, it had a lot more punch and meaning within lefty circles and it wasn't like this demonized term. And so as the problem with tankies and those that will jump down your throat for any perceived... Uh, issue they take with you started to rear its head within uh, lefty spaces a word like woke scold uh, came up to mm. describe these types but now we, these types of uh, yeah. people have de have designated themselves cornbread tube they do this because they think that all of the lefty debate bro streamers are racist um, like a very prominent figure in this community made a video calling a um, a black streamer named shark 300 a, a a slur that's not something I'm going to repeat, but it's a slur that basically means black race traitor, essentially. And um, it, it ended up being big discourse for this entire side of the left was attacking him and harassing him. And uh, essentially because he doesn't hate Vosh or other debate streamers that are white. Ooh. And it, it, it was this really weird schism that was like borderline like motivated by race but also a lot by the uh tanky side of the left and so there's there's this right now you've got like the tanky slash cornbread tube side of the left and then you've got like the more moderate like arguably liberal leaning but mostly like anarchist to soak dem uh part of the online left which is like me and my circle of friends like i'm friends with most people that are making content that are not doing Russia apologia or are not like engaging in harassment campaigns against people because they said noodles are tasty, stuff like that. What? No, what? <laughs> you don't want to know, man. You don't want to know. Yeah. It doesn't make how any sense. Any... Yeah, how is any of this interesting? Sorry. <laughs> it's, just... it, it's not. Um, yeah. It's it's like the, the, the part of it that's interesting yeah, okay. is the fact that the people... I mean, okay, are... okay, wait, 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 wait. I have to be also aware that... 
I'm probably hearing your perspective on this. So yeah, yeah no, I'm, absolutely. Listen, yeah, if you want to, yeah, if you want to see other people's it, perspective on it, I absolutely. I don't want feel to see free. any perspective on this. Fuck <laughs> this shit. I'm not interested. <laughs> this is. I'm sorry. This just. Yeah, I get it. Woke, I get it. Woke scold. That's it's, a, it's all terminally yeah. online shit. It, it really, really is. Yeah, the, just... the only term that I recognize is tanky. I know that. That is what yeah. uh, British Communist Party called um, members who were pro-Soviet invasion of Hungary, if I'm not mistaken. I believe yeah. that's the the origin. Yeah. We don't we don't use that term anymore, by the way. At least in my circles and, and with my educational background, the the term is sort of. I, it's you reductive. use the term tanky. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, I, we just I, call them Marxist Leninists because that is what that, they that's are. That's what they are, the yeah. It's basically just an obfuscational term that doesn't really describe accurately who they are to a degree. Well, the. the, the yeah, well, what, what you just told me is a bit. The funny thing is, why? at least. Why do you people do this? This is just. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> I didn't invent the term. It's just a word that, that I hear online. No, no, it's, no, it was why useful. do you this? This this cornbread what? Oh, noodles, cornbread tube. Okay. What noodles tasty? What what the? Okay. Racial I'll... slurs, woke like no. Okay. So whatever. <laughs> the 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 key point is essentially that um there are people on the online left that will try to get you to commit suicide because you said what? noodles are tasty. They will try to harass you and bully you into suicide because you said noodles are tasty. That's the thing that has happened. And I, I promise you, I'm not oversimplifying it. I'm not twisting it out of, like, from a biased perspective. That is what happened. Yeah, I don't like Italian <laughs> food either, but this is just, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's it's too fatty. But, <laughs> and I can speak from experience here. Yeah. But yeah, this just sounds <laughs> like, like like I told you, like in my group, the biggest issue that we're discussing is how to how to deal with when you made a mistake in your video. What do you do? How do you how do what is the best way to admit to a mistake? Basically, um, factual errors in videos. I think yeah. Is, I think that is far more interesting than whatever shit you just rambled about. <laughs> this is no. just. <laughs> No, yeah. I, I'm sorry. It, is... it, I'm just referencing drama stuff that's happened in this sphere. It's it's really it's the kind of stuff that now that I'm not on Twitter anymore, I'm so glad that I don't have to care about outside of jokes. You know, like joking around with my audience about it and references. But what you've done is absolutely like based as hell, and it's what I'm trying to do. Like me and my sphere of content creator friends that that like. You know, we get along and we hang out in real life. Uh, I, I'm trying to get into making more real life content, particularly with guns. Like I know here in America, you just can't get around gun culture. It's just pervasive. Yeah, but, but so... I can I can tell you if you really want to separate yourself from drama, it's more the it's it's self restraint. Well, That's yeah. like the secret to it. It's well, not responding to anyone who says something nasty about you. And, it, and yeah. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That is really really hard. It's it is. really difficult to restrain yourself. I from, think from doing the monkey brain thing of attacking back. I think a lot of it as well that you have to account for is whether or not you're even in their line of sight, right? My like Who's I've line noticed of sight? the people like Who's whoever line? it is that wants to go after you, right? So that's oh, different yeah. for me than for you, right? So for me, like when I'm on Twitter making posts dunking on a conservative, that's getting me in the eyes of people that are going to try to jump on me, right? I'm not on Twitter anymore. Instead, I'm looking into doing content where I, like, make entertaining and hopefully informative educational uh, gun videos that uh, can appeal to an audience that is tired of just every gun video on YouTube being like, All right, now, the Democrats are trying to take your Second Amendment right, and the ATF, those Bud, Link, those Bud Light drinking fuckers, are trying to disarm it. Like, I I'd like there to be a bit of an alternative. Stuff, yeah. You know, so it's like yeah, like, like that. That was like one of the last few interactions that I think I had with you was like, um, like I like to sometimes call this stuff culture war stuff. Actually, I I don't I don't know if I should continue saying this, but like the last thing that I had in that regard was like um, when when J.K. Rowling, uh, when the game the Harry Potter game or something was released, I had like um, people uh, 
slipped into my DMs and sent me emails and even called me and were like, yeah, don't buy the game. I was really funny because, dude, I'm a 32-year-old man. I don't play Harry Potter games. I play with adult things like Legos. <laughs> So, <laughs> but no, it was just it was that was sort of like the last interaction I had with that. That that was really weird. Like, yeah, I I I remember watching that one a bit because um it sparked my interest a bit. So um, I remember back in the anti SJW days, right? The the group that I part was part of like really despised J.K. Rowling. Like I do remember back in the day how Sagan used to call Jacob Rowling like the woke she bitch and shit like that. She was supposed to be an SJW because she like yeah yeah she re retroactively I, uh, made characters gay for like woke points. Yeah. but yeah yeah. Now she's and, that, and, and, and it was really funny when that game came out and you know people messaged me don't play the game and I didn't even know that there was a Harry Potter game and I didn't really care much but I went to watch some right-wing twitch streamers and other platforms I, it was so funny that these people who a few years before you know they raged about jk rowling and now they're playing this fucking game i was it was really entertaining to watch these these guys play this harry potter game because it was so obvious they didn't like the game but they played it anyway and pretended to like it it was so fucking hilarious to watch that this oh i enjoy this game so much even though it was so Ah, that that was sort of like one of the last engagements I had there. That yeah. was a fun Sorry one. For yeah. Yeah, no problem. Sorry for distracting. No, 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 it's no yeah. it's no issue. I do feel like we gotta wrap things up soon though, because I'm uh I'm okay. pretty tired. I stayed up real late last night streaming Final Fantasy fourteen and then I woke up really early this morning to clean up my apartment and the, now the, the all one of thing that, that was really weird. The the okay. one thing weird about this was like that it took a week for us to get to stream. I did not know like back in back when I used to do streams in in the Bronze Age, um, we just always did them spontaneously. It was really weird to see that you guys don't have like this entire setup that you plan things really carefully with segments and everything, and that you take a week or several days to set things up. That was really interesting to see. Yeah, it's yeah. it's. One of those interesting things about the evolution of streaming, and it's different for everybody, like XQC is one of the biggest streamers out there, and that dude just throws on his stream, gets a few th tens of thousands of people watching, and just watches YouTube videos. But like most you know, larger streamers usually have an itinerary planned out because it's, it's hard to just be like, all right, I'm live. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's a skill. Like we said before, it's a skill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. since you want to wrap things up, I'll, I'll just say, like, it, it, I guess, you know, we don't really share an audience anymore, but I know that there are people who, like, think that there is still simmering tension or aggravation between our spheres, and I, I, I kind of really want to dispel that. Like, yeah. It's been three years. I think we moved on anyway, and other than that, we, I think we all had time to self-reflect on these matters anyway. So we... There is no raging aggravation or anger between us, and I think we should just go do our thing, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. What I really, miss? Yeah, this combo is awesome. I love building bridges, because there's just been too much negativity in this space lately. I feel like even my audience feels it, and this is going to be a breath of fresh air for everybody involved. Okay. Well, Thank I'm you so... happy to help. Yeah, no problem. I really and appreciate you coming you on. Thank you for opening the door. And, um, yeah. I'll talk to you, I don't know, at some point in the future, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. I have to go out. Get... Adam something is here in this city. I'm Ooh. going out with him tomorrow. Yeah. Nice. I'm trying to talk him into moving to Vienna. Um... <laughs> All right. I'll see you tomorrow, then. I hope you have a great day. You too. Um, have a good one. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. That was a fun combo. That went really, really well.